Okay, I have five o'clock, so we'll go ahead and call to order this special meeting of the Brandon City Council at 5 p.m. on December 21st. Christina, can you call the roll? Clark? Aye. David? Aye. Here. Aye. Here. Here. Jorgensen? Here. Cole? Here. Parliament? Here. Mayor Lumber? Here. Brian Reed will not be in attendance tonight. He has uh, some medical issues, so he will not be here for either meeting. Just FYI. I'd entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor, or Christina? Okay, the purpose of the meeting is to have an interview with Landscapes Unlimited for a golf course management contract. I would uh, ask that representatives come forth to the podium and uh, do an interview for the first. If you wanted to just do an in, uh, overview of your proposal, your RFP, just a quick uh, five minute overview, and then I think the council will ask you some questions. I think is the way we're thinking about proceeding, if that's okay with you. Certainly. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Lundberg, members of the council. My name is Tom Everett. I'm president of Landscapes Golf Management. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come and visit with you this evening. You had expressed uh, uh, concern in an RFP format with, uh, with your golf course um, here, Brandon City Golf Course. And we're here to uh, describe, we, we responded to your RFP and we come before you today with a with a solution to see if perhaps what we have uh, to offer meets your needs. Mayor Lundberg, if, if okay with you, um, we put together just a, a brief PowerPoint presentation that we incorporated the, the 13 questions um, that were presented to us to respond to within the context of our presentation, if that's okay? That's very good. Okay. So just, just, I'll interrupt you just a little okay. bit. Just uh, remember that I have an hour, one hour before my regular meeting, so kind of time it so we have a little bit of time at the end for questions, specific questions that the council may have. Understood, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, first I thought we'd just take a, um, for, for a historical perspective, just take a brief look back at, uh, at, the, at, at who our company is. The company was founded in 1976 by a gentleman by the name of Bill Kubley. Bill was a landscape architect graduate from the University of Wisconsin who moved to Lincoln to work for a golf course design builder. He did so for a period of about three or four years and, and ultimately decided that, uh, you know what, this is something that he could do on his own. He's, it, it really is a true American success story. Bill set out, um, and you can see in the picture, with a, a Keebler delivery truck as his, uh, as his office, so to speak. And, a pickup truck and a trencher and, and away he went. As a matter of fact, uh, the Brandon Golf Course was one of his first jobs back uh, in the late 70s. So um, there's a few key um, happenings in our company's evolution that I'd just like to draw your attention to. Um, Bill grew the company through the late 70s and early 80s just really by doing quality work and work with integrity. He grew the company into one of the premier golf construction companies in the world. Um, in, in 1988, Bill was presented with the opportunity to have uh, a stake of ownership in the Amana Colonies Golf Course in Amana, Iowa. That was pivotal just for a few reasons, but over the course of about the next 10 years or so, we had other opportunities that, that Bill took, uh, took upon to, to own golf courses. And as the, as the industry was growing through the 90s and the Tiger Woods uh, impact and we were growing at uh, golf, the, the National Golf Foundation came up with a statistic that said we needed to add a golf course a day for 10 years. And so that was a really good time to be in the golf course construction business. In, late 19, uh, in the late 90s, uh, there was a strategic decision made within the company to grow a portfolio of, of owned assets for our own account. The value in a construction company is really just in your backlog of work, and Bill wanted to diversify the company to, to build long-term value and create a, a portfolio of, of owned assets for our own account. And that's where I came in. I, I joined the, the company in 1999 to do just that, and we did that in earnest 
um, for about the next eight or ten years, whereby we accumulated a, a portfolio of, of owned properties of about 25, 25 golf courses. <clears throat> Over the course of that time, we uh, established a team of people to operate those golf courses. And I, I say that I, I identify those, uh, those three key points in the company's evolution for a couple of reasons. We cut our teeth with, in the industry with our own money. So we, we paid our tuition, if you will, by, by making mistakes with properties that we, that we owned. So we, we come at the golf course management business really with a, with a seasoned um, you know, ownership mentality. So when we work with entities like the city of, of Brandon, we're stewards of your assets, just like we would be if, as if we owned them. And, and so over the course of time, what, what does that look like today? Today we have uh, about 10 public and private facilities that we own. We manage about 50, and we're located in, in uh, 20 states from California in the west to, to Maryland in the east and, uh, and pretty much everything in between. We also have uh, a client in Victoria, British Columbia, a 36-hole resort there, as well as uh, a 36-hole resort in Shanghai, China that we're managing as well. So we, uh, we have a team of about 25 people that manages those 50 uh, properties, and, and uh, a couple of my esteemed colleagues are with me today. And uh, we have grown into one of the top 10 largest golf management companies in the uh, in the in the United States, and and we continue to be the nation's premier golf construction um, and irrigation company. So, just a, a, a graphic illustration of kind of where we're located. We have our headquarters in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we have uh, we have satellite offices from Arizona in the west to Maryland in the east, and and Florida in the south. And we really have what I feel like are uh, you know some of the the best in the in the business in their respective fields. We are, we are involved today with affordable daily fee properties, such as uh, the City of Brandon Golf Course, as well as very high-end exclusive private clubs and, and everything in between. This, is the, this, this picture illustrates here what the City of Brandon would be investing in. You would be investing in a team of people that get out of bed every day with the objective of achieving your goals for your property. I have two of uh, the gentlemen on that picture with me here today. Um, like I said, two of the, the best in the field in their, uh, in their respective areas, and uh, I'll give them the opportunity to, to uh, visit with you here this evening as well. Just a few of our uh, unique areas where we excel in um, that, that aren't illustrated in, in that previous picture, and, and that would be just, uh, oops, excuse me, just uh, in fleet management. You know, there's uh, one of your largest assets that you've invested in out at the golf course is your maintenance equipment, and we feel like we're le we lead the industry in making sure that that fleet is properly equipped and properly maintained and properly financed um, to 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 maximize your your investment. Also, uh, our our accounting, we have a team of about 12 accountants in our Lincoln uh, headquarters that are producing the, the financial statements and accounts payable for, for all of our property. Steve Merkel is our director of agronomy. Um, and then also we, uh, we have a division of our company that, that deals with uh, you know, infrastructure and vertical project management. So what it really boils down to is we have one of the most dynamic golf com companies in the industry, uh, all under one roof and able to self-perform you know, whatever the needs are that you have here um, at the city of, of Brandon. I'm going to give uh, Mr. Scott Wellman an opportunity here to visit with you just about um, a few of the marketing related questions that you had and uh, he'll come up and address those. Scott? Thanks, Tom. Good evening. I'm uh, Scott Wellman. I'm the Director of Marketing and Revenue Management uh, for Landscapes Golf Management. Um, I've got just a few slides pulled together and we're going to address a couple of those those first few questions that you have in, in the next few slides here. Um, for those of you that are familiar with marketing, I, I love this graphic because I think it, it articulates the complexity of, of marketing today. 
uh, for any business, uh, let alone be a golf course. And so on the left-hand side, you have the tried and true uh, traditional things that we've all been accustomed to, getting people to the physical store, running commercials, running print ads, direct mail. These types of tactics have been along for a long time, and many of them are still very valuable today. Uh, direct mail, believe it or not, is still a very viable option in terms of marketing. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, the types of tactics that have started to become in favor over the last few years that, quite honestly, uh, give the golf business a competitive edge. So advertising through email, advertising through social media, promoting yourself through, through apps and the web, sending push notifications or text messages, these types of tactics uh, have become uh, very, very inexpensive to do. Uh, they can cause you to, to reach a wider audience uh, than we used to before, and the audience is much more targeted than it was before. And so we can actually focus on those individuals that may be interested in having a banquet, host a golf outing, uh, potentially be interested in membership or just even booking a round of golf. So I think it articulates the complexity of, of marketing and, and the challenges that can bring to, to be relevant in all of these spaces uh, at a facility. And so one of the things we specialize in is providing resources and, and education uh, to all of our golf courses so they can become uh, experts in these in these areas. One of the one of the big things that that I'm a believer in is is growing the business through through retention and acquisition. I believe retention really uh, comes back to to two major things. Do your do your customers and your members feel like they're communicated to regularly? Um, every anytime I see a facility that is potentially going in, in the wrong direction, a lot of times it comes back to poor communication. Um, but the second thing is providing a robust and unique event schedule that people walk away from your facility really feeling like they had a neat experience. And so, you know, one of the things that we work on with our golf courses is making sure at the beginning of the year that we have a really robust event schedule for the year, both socially and on the golf side. Um, and so by doing so, we can really establish a, a really unique experience. <clears throat> the images that you see up here are, are from a facility that, that I'm sure you all are aware of. Uh, the city of Sioux Falls has, has done a fantastic job of, of, in 2020, creating some new and unique experiences. The couple's tailgate with COVID that, you know, obviously a big challenge trying to get people together uh, inside of a building. And so they, they actually use their entire parking lot uh, as a place for, for hosting some people after, after a couple's event they had at their facility. The Fast Five, we, we had tried to figure out how to utilize that, that East Nine at Elmwood in a, in a better fashion. It was, was really underutilized. And so we came up with an idea for a quick five hole round of golf, that experience that we could provide to, to people in the city of Sioux Falls. And then on the right, you can see the culmination of the, the city series at, at Sioux Falls. Uh, we've got the mayor there. We had a Ryder Cup type event. Uh, it was an event that people could qualify throughout the year for by playing in events and participating and, and playing well in the events. And as you can see, it was a it was a really, really fun day there. So retention really kind of comes back to, to those two things in, in my book. In 2021, I think we have a really unique opportunity in our industry. Every golf course across the country has seen record growth in terms of rounds. Uh, the only ones that haven't had pretty significant shutdowns, or maybe they were very specific in nature, but no matter if you were a private or public facility, we saw record rounds uh, across the country. So what does that mean for 2021? A lot of these people were new and unique customers that we hadn't seen either ever or hadn't seen for quite some time. So at the end of the day, it's, it's really about how do we capitalize on those customers that visited our facility in 2020 and, and keep them in the future as, as other activities start to come back into play for those individuals. And so having robust player development programs, as you see here, is essential uh, to us keeping the business as we move forward, especially in your market. So in your market, uh, the number of interested golfers in the, in the market is a little bit below the US average. So we created a little bit of uniqueness in our industry in 2020, but it's not gonna take much for them to, to go back away and fall out of favor of golf. So having beginner women's programs, having junior golf programs, 
being a part of a PGA Junior League, being a part of, of having a, a Get Golf Ready class for beginner golfers is really quite important, I think, to, to keeping your business and sustaining it as you, as you move forward. Youth programming, uh, as I mentioned, is, is going to be a huge component to this. Um, we've uh, just entered into a new agreement with a, with a company called Iconic uh, that we think is going to be a pretty unique experience where we can actually take uh, your teachers at your facilities and have them be personal coaches, uh, virtual coaches for people that are interested in golf but maybe can't get to the facility as frequently as they, as they would like to. We can create an experience for them to get better at home, to get better on the driving range, and ultimately spend, spend more dollars at your facilities. But then on top of that, it's about investing in your junior golf camps, your high school clinics. And as you can see here, we got a lot of neat things that are, that are going on at Sioux Falls that really have grown that, that business through, through Danny Sinkson over there. So a couple of, of the initial questions uh, that you had. One was around reciprocal programs uh, with the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, I did have an opportunity to, to talk with, with Justin Arlt, our market manager for the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, we outlined some things that conceptually we think are, are things that, that we could partner on. Uh, obviously, we'd love to have more conversation uh, on this if we would be happen to be selected, but uh, we've got our member advantage program. So the member advantage program actually gives members at your facility access to 30 golf courses across the country at a, at a reduced rate. So at our private facilities, it grants them the access to play at our public facilities. It's 50% off the, the posted rate. So, you know, it's a great opportunity not only to engage with the city of Sioux Falls, uh, but all the, all the other golf courses across the country that, that we're interacting with. Uh, we talked about an opportunity for add-on passes, so maybe an opportunity for you know, a small fee to, to be able to add the Sioux Falls golf courses onto your, your Brandon membership. Vice versa, the opportunity for the Sioux Falls golf members to, to do the same. Uh, dedicated days uh, for your members to, to come play the city of Sioux Falls golf courses and, and vice versa. So maybe it's an exchange uh, of players that we do on a given day. And then lastly, I know a, a big topic that has come up has been, been the flooding, but you know, this would provide, I think, some additional insulation should you, should you experience that again with us be able, being able to help you out through that process. Travel Leagues kind of falls into the same opportunity. Uh, Justin and I both, as we discussed, the dedicated days, you know, to do a member exchange. Certainly we recognize that you may have a league that wants to go play a city of Sioux Falls golf course as a, as a retreat. And likewise, they may have some as well. So we think we can uh, come up with an amicable way to, to kind of create an exchange there. Um, so these are the opportunities that, uh, that I think really exists uh, for any facility, but, but in particular, I tried to tailor these to, to, to Brandon. The first is to, as we're heading into to January and February, is to, to make sure that, you know, you've vigorously built your email distribution list. You've got your customers pulled together. You're collecting that data every time somebody, somebody comes to visit your facility and that you're planning for the next 52 weeks. So it starts with putting together a good plan in January. What, do, what are you going to do each week of the, of the month uh, for the rest of the year? It doesn't have to be 100% of the way done, but if you can get it 80% of the way there, then you leave some flexibility for some things that you may want to fold in. But I can tell you facilities that don't plan in January and February when the arrows start flying and, and golfers are showing up at your course, uh, becomes a challenge at that point to, to try to be able to think through those things. Uh, make sure the website is the focal point of, of everything you do. So uh, awesome job uh, by Andrew. You got your event results that are out there. Online tee times, so obviously through your, your light speed contract are, are there. Lead forms is one that I'd love to, to see happen. So on your banquet page, on your golf outing page, on your membership page, Let's get some forms out there where people can actually request uh, uh, more information. Uh, that's going to streamline that process instead of them having to, to call you. Um, and then your event registrations uh, to go on there. It's really important that we drive people to your website on a regular basis because it's going to help the SEO of your website. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with that search engine optimization, the more hits we can get going to your website. Uh, the more likely we are to increase you in the search ranking on, on, a, on a platform like Google. Next is, is social. So I'd love 
for Brandon to start getting involved in Instagram for sure. Twitter, I can I can deal with if a facility doesn't want to be on that. But but Instagram is a is a site that we need to to be relevant on, and it's really easy to post at the same time you're posting to Facebook. So I think that you know getting an Instagram page set up would be valuable, and then increasing the number of posts. So right now we've got posts going out 1.3 times per week. In 2020, we'd love to see that improve, and you can kind of see the benchmark there against what we're doing in Sioux Falls at 4.5 times per week. Um, build a robust event schedule and promote it. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Automate where you can to make data-driven decisions. So one of the things that uh, we've launched uh, just in the last 90 days is our uh, business intelligence project. So I'm a big believer in transparency and accountability. And if we can take all of the data that somebody at the facility would need uh, to, to lead that facility, put it in one centralized location that they can come and they can speak to the results that are happening at the facility, I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think too often we spend too much of our time trying to collect that data instead of trying to automate it, centralize it, and then to actually talk about the results uh, versus uh, spending time pulling it. Next is to digitally advertise to promote leagues, outings, banquets, and membership. Primarily we're talking about Google and Facebook. Here is opportunities to, to promote the, 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 the kind of the, what we call sales pipelines of the organization. And then lastly, as we talked about, uh, player development. So Tom, I think you have yeah, you these right here. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Okay, just uh, <clears throat> questions three, four, and five I wanted to take the opportunity to address for you here today. Number three, just being centered around uh, your, your human resources, your people. Um, we, uh, we're, we absolutely want to retain your people. We have a 60-day probationary period, and really what we're look looking for is two things, open minds and positive attitudes. We, we just need fertile soil that we can, that we can fertilize and water and, and get them to be as productive as, as, as we can. Um, if, we're, if we're getting pushed back at every turn, it's probably not going to work out very well. But we, uh, we absolutely want to retain your people. Um, that, that can, um, that's a promise that we make, uh, that we're going to do that. And uh, um, we look forward to, to the opportunity to work with Andrew and, and Kelly and uh, and uh, making them an important part of our team going forward. Um, number four uh, re was related to full-time equivalents. You have three full-time employees at the property today. Our, our staffing plan did illustrate um, six, uh, I believe is what it, what it illustrated. And, and that's really just a reallocation of your existing payroll. So what's included in our pro forma that was in our proposal took into account your, your payroll at the property today. We reallocated it among um, some, some support resources that we feel like are needed in order to give Andrew and Kelly the opportunity to, to, uh, func to focus on the highest payoff activities. If we're asking the leader of your business to be you know, pulling out carts and washing carts 40 hours a week, that means he's probably not focusing on driving and growing the business as much as perhaps he could be. Um, number five, uh, how specifically would, uh, would we envision covering our, our cost? Um, it, looks, it appears as though you're going to be positive uh, in 2020 um, from an operations and, and maintenance standpoint. Um, and I guess I'd just uh, take the opportunity to, to touch on um, just growing business. That's going to happen in, uh, in one of a couple different ways. Um, there's no silver, first of all, there's no sil silver bullet. We have to capture more market share. We have to grow the game. Basically, the, all, all the activities that, that Scott just described, we have to capture, we have to get golfers to come to the city of Brandon more often than they're going to your competitors. Um, and we need to continue to grow the game. So driving revenue first and foremost, getting more from each, go each golfer. What, what type of upsell strategies can we make to get one extra dollar from every one of your 20,000 rounds? Um, those are the types of things that that's how we are going to pay our, 
our management fee is by growing your revenues, growing your rounds. Certainly, there, we feel like there are opportunities whatever, whenever we come into a new operation to, to operate more efficiently. Um, you know, that is just a fact, and it's, you know, we have case studies that, uh, that speak to that. Um, and then, certainly, we're going to leverage the, the, the purchasing power that we've been able to create over the course of the last 20 years and uh, across 50 properties um, across the country. We just have a, a bigger basis that we can negotiate, um, you know, better pricing from equipment to, to golf cars to golf shop merchandise, um, food and beverage. Uh, and everything else, uh, you know, at the facility. The other thing we're going to do is we're just going to make sure we, in, in our business plan, which we will deliver to the to the city for approval, we're going to make sure that we understand the market. Um, we have a, a leave behind piece here for uh, for the mayor and, and members of the council here that we took the opportunity to just um, to to study and understand. Uh, you know, the, what the market looks like within a 30-minute uh, drive around uh, Brandon Golf Course. Just, uh, you know, identifying here your, your competitors, and we need to make sure that people are not um, driving past us to, to, to get out to Laverne Country Club or to, or to River Ridge that we're capturing before they're able to get there. And then, of course, leveraging our, uh, our relationship with, uh, with the city of Sioux Falls as well. So... And, and leveraging what's, uh, you know, all of the strengths that we have at, at, uh, at the city of Brandon. You have a beautiful golf course, uh, a beautiful clubhouse with a wonderful view over that golf course and selling that against your competitors. You're doing on time, okay? Doing all right on time. Um, number six, uh, what happens with the positive operations and maintenance each season? Um, all that goes back to the city. We, in our proposal, identified that, that uh, we'd like to have an opportunity to, to do better than our proposed management fee if, uh, if and when we are able to drive the results. So we truly want to look at, look at this as a, uh, as a partnership and, and share in the upside as well. So, um, but we're, we're in business to achieve your objectives for the property, which is relieving the city of financial burden and reinvesting in, in, the, uh, in the physical plant. Number seven, uh, pricing volumes and discounts. I, I spoke a little bit to that. Um, all of those, the, the, the city benefits from all of our, um, all of our vendor purchasing uh, relationships that we, that we have. Uh, I, at, a, at a sales volume of a little bit more than a million dollars or a million two, I expect that number to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $30,000 and can be higher in certain years when you're investing in new equipments and new carts. Those are bigger ticket items where we have an opportunity to, to drive uh, additional, purchase, uh, additional rebates and discounts in those years. Number eight, um, what would the plans be to increase use and revenue in our upstairs banquet hall and community room? Um, I'd like uh, to bring Scott back up here and just touch on a few of those. And then um, I, uh, my colleague, Mark Young here, our director of food and beverage, will speak to, to just how we're going to maximize the profit from that business as well. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Tom. Well, first of all, I had an opportunity to, to see the banquet room the, this afternoon. And, and what, a, what a neat facility and, and obviously uh, a lot of opportunity, uh, I think, in that, that particular room. So... I mentioned earlier digital advertising. I think that's a big component of it. Um, we know that, that uh, especially in platforms like Google, especially coming up in Q1, uh, when <coughs> folks are most generally going to get engaged, the first place they're going to look is a, a place to book as a banquet hall. So um, we need to be relevant there. And, and, and when people are out there searching for a place to, to have a wedding, we need to, to be very relevant. Same thing goes um, in, in Q4, as it not, maybe not this year, obviously, but in, in future years, holiday parties are, are big uh, in, in terms of advertising uh, digitally as well. There's, there's some really neat things that are coming down the road. Uh, we're actually exploring a, a new opportunity with, with Hulu that, uh, through the streaming service that actually is going to bring TV advertising back in favor. 
uh, from a from a from a standpoint of being able to do it on a on a pretty uh, pretty small budget. So we can get two weeks of targeted TV advertising on Hulu for about 500 bucks. So uh, we think that's going to be a neat way to to promote banquets at a, at a critical time. Um, you know, outside of that, we we do ask our facilities to engage with our CRM tool, uh, Zendesk Cell. It's a proprietary tool that we've built uh, in conjunction with, with Zendesk. It's a way for us to, to manage the lead and sales process. Um, so you'll have more visibility into what are the number of leads that we're generating for the facility and at what level of success are we having in, in moving those leads into to actual sales. And so it's the only tool that, that I'm aware of that really kind of creates those, those leading indicators uh, for, for folks like yourself to, to be able to see how, how that's performing. And then lastly, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in whoever is actively selling that room being a, a active participant in their community you know, being a part of, 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 you know, different events that are happening within the community, budgeting a, a few marketing dollars to, to have that person be out in, in, the, in the community and, and promoting themselves. Um, and I should have mentioned one other one, being relevant on, if you're looking to book weddings, being relevant on the wedding wire or the knot are, are really good places to, to be as well. People, people look to those uh, platforms uh, to, to book weddings and and so that's a that's a great place to to start if, if you're looking to to get some folks in at your facility so thanks Mark Young, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I had the good fortune of working with all the food and beverage operators within our organization. So now we finally get to talk about something fun, food and beverage, so appreciate it. Uh, Tom will come back to the flood. I think he touched on it a little bit with how we were able to utilize Sioux Falls. So um, food and beverage is one of, the, one of the things that our company has probably invested in the most over the past 20 years, and it's because Food and beverage at too many facilities, especially in the municipal world, are lost leaders. And, and we found a way just by getting creative to manage that business profitably. And, and so it subsidizes losses and eventually turns, turns, the, turns the business into operating black. And without boring you with all the nitty gritty and details, we do comprehensive training with our food and beverage operators. Um, we segment the business into six segments. and. It covers not just, hey, I serve food and I cook food, but it gets into managing the business side of it. So really important to us. But as you see that cycle, you get into financial performance assets, daily ops, all the way around you get to employee experience. And in our experience in the food and beverage business, as well as the golf business, is we're only as good as our worst employee. We're only as good as that worst server, the one that you just, when you see them working, you don't want them to take care of you. So our biggest focus as it relates to food and beverage and, and company-wide is really understanding the employee journey, you know, what, what these employees are. And it begins with that recruitment. And, and as Tom alluded to, when it comes to onboarding a staff that, that we take over to help a, a municipality or a board, we want to give everyone the opportunity to be successful. So the employee journey really is something that we put together couple years ago with about 25 of our food and beverage managers in a room and we we had an exercise and we have seven uh, stages and the exercise to that is each of those stages how can we be better and as we get into there I think when it comes to onboarding training development and overall employee experience those three in the middle are the meat of how we are successful with, as it relates to food and beverage so really proud of what we've been able to do Another thing that I think differentiates what we look for uh, when it comes to food and beverage is, you know, it's, it's not the tip-driven mentalities. We want people to care. We want people that have a sense of gratification. If you order a drink and they get your drink, they're, they're making your day. Typically, they're making my day at least. But uh, So the attitude of servanthood is really different. And when you go to our properties, and I hope some of you, if you're traveling, look up some of our facilities just to go see firsthand, but it's a different mentality. I'm not gonna read all of these for the sake of time. We wanna make sure and save 
uh, save time for additional questions, but there's a restaurant server and then there's an exceptional club server. A restaurant server is tip driven. An exceptional club server, they, they're there because they enjoy the job. They enjoy getting to know people. You'll have access to this deck and you'll see what I mean. Uh, I think every one of you, if you've dined out in the past, will have experienced a typical restaurant server and hopefully some of you have experienced the exceptional servers as well. But as far as how we operate, you know, when it comes to manager development, we've got it broken down and we've got very clear expectations. We've got a 160 page training manual that's not read cover to cover, it's, it's training and development that we provide. Job descriptions, employee handbook, and to me one of the most important ones is goal setting. We want to know what every employee, every manager's goals are, so that's part of us also sharing our goals for them as they work with us. Support, training, fish, and continual development. The continual development, we do, we do monthly best practice, peer sharing, peer development. We have customized two, three, four week development plans. If somebody wants to get better on the HR side of the business or if somebody wants to get better on the financial side of the business, we're, we're here to help them work on that. Uh, the fish program I think was touched on in the original proposal services. I'm not going to get into that because that's a whole nother conversation. But uh, the last one is the accountability. Uh, any of you have kids? Anybody? <laughs> you ever tell them, hey, just bring home C's and D's, we'll be okay? They will. They'll bring home C's and D's. You tell them I expect A's, they're probably going to get A's. And, and that's kind of what we do. We set clear expectations and we coach in the moment. If we get a progress report that's not looking good, we're not going to wait six months, eight months for their annual performance review. We coach in the moment, and I think that helps us with our success in food and beverage. Because let me tell you, food and beverage is a tough business. Uh, it, it really is. So it's almost like a different business within the golf business. I'm sure you've experienced that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, performance management, uh, you know, we do, we do provide... Uh, performance <clears throat> reviews in detail every four months for all of our managers and we also provide uh, performance reviews for our most seasoned staff, seasonal staff, year round, so really proud of that. Not going to read all of these bullets but you know looking at the financial performance at, at the Brandon I think uh, it, it's no different than a lot of food and beverage operations we've, we've inherited and, and worked with. But <clears throat> We look at controlling costs a little bit different than just a percentage. And so our, our systematic approach to that isn't just on raising prices, it's everything. It's all things from inventory management to your sales mix. And I think we've got a really good process that we're able to work with our food and beverage managers on. Um, prime cost, uh, who likes KPIs, key performance indicators? Anybody with your everyday work? Some people love them, some people hate them. One of the most important key performance indicators as it relates to food and beverage is dealing with prime cost. Instead of just looking at margins for food or payroll, we actually combine payroll, we combine food costs, and that's, that's called your prime cost. If you're able to manage that, you're gonna have a profitable business. So that's kind of where, where it is with our food and beverage operations. And it's not a slide in here, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the things I'm most proud of, having been with this company for 20 years, is, is being famous for something. We challenge every one of our food and beverage operations to become famous. We don't want to be working with a municipality and, and being a competitor to the restaurants down the street. But we want the city to be proud of their asset as it relates to food and beverage. And one of the ways we do that is, is becoming famous. And so... Uh, we've got a purple cow exercise that we do globally, and it's a, it's a contest where, where our food and beverage managers, our kitchen managers, they come up with something that they can only get at the Brandon Golf Course. And, and that's becoming famous for something. It could be a beverage, a wild Bloody Mary. It could be just a sandwich or something that just has a wow factor. And that's something as, you know, city uh, council members and, and constituents, uh, when you have a golf course, it, it should be something you're proud of. And, and that food and beverage piece is, is what we hope to be able to provide us some pride in what, what's being serviced out of there. So I'm going to hand it back off Thank to the you. president. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mark.
Okay, just stepping back uh, to question number nine was, rel was uh, related to the golf course flooding. Um, we, when we enter new relationships, we, t we truly view it as a partnership. Um, while we have fixed costs that we have to, you know, have to satisfy in our business, we're going to work with the city to do whatever it takes to, to, to demonstrate our level of partnership, whether that's, you know, taking our fee down to a certain level um, while the course is closed or, or flooded for that matter. Um, and as long as, you know, we might have the opportunity to recover that fee at some point in the future. Um, and that's just being a good partner when the, when the city's down, um, we're going to experience that with you. And then when the upside's there, we'd like to experience that as well. As it relates to uh, the, the capital um, projects that, that you've outlined here, is it, uh, the, the, the retaining wall that's falling down in the parking lot and the cart paths, et cetera, et cetera, that was really key. The key to the point that I made earlier that we're owners, um, we understand the, that those things need to be um, updated and improved. Um, first and foremost, we're, we want all the we want to generate as much profit through the operation as we can to fix those things. So first and foremost, we have to maintain the maintain and update the asset um, so that number one, nobody gets hurt. Number two, the city puts its best foot forward as it relates to the to the amenity that you're offering your constituents. As it relates to, uh, so number two, ma first of all, maintaining the asset, and number two would be I identifying opportunities to reinvest, which would then create additional prop, uh, revenue and profit um, for, for the city to reinvest back into the golf course or for, to support other areas of the, uh, of the city. So um, we did propose some some projects in your uh, in our proposal. Those were not factored in our pro forma. We were simply responding to the need that the re that the request um, stipulated. There 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 are ideas to at some point in the future generate additional revenue. Um, I was uh, I'm I'm proud to stand before you today that I was one of the, on the team that that proposed to the city of Sioux Falls. And one of the things that we proposed was building a new clubhouse at Elmwood. And we have improved the operations uh, enough to the point that we are now prepared to be able to do that. So um, we're working with the city uh, to, to position um, you know, the, that to take place, as well as uh, to redo the irrigation at Prairie Greens. And, and we've gotten the op we've delivered upon what we said we would as far as improving the operations to position us to be able to reinvest in the, in the properties. So we look forward to being able to achieve that objective for you here uh, in the future as well. Um, as we're winding down here, just a few case studies I uh, wanted to just focus on here. Um, I just mentioned the, uh, the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, that, was, that was quite a process that we went through there. Um, I think if you spoke with the people over there, they would uh, describe a positive experience, a positive experience with, uh, with our people and with us doing what we say we would do. Um, the, the performance has really been there. Um, in, in 2018, when, uh, when we had the, you know, one of the wettest years in history, we still were able to improve in our first year, uh, improve operations about a quarter of a million dollars better than they were the prior year. So, and that's just continued to ramp up. And, uh, and like I said, we're positioning um, those properties to be able to reinvest and update. Kings Deer, Monument, Colorado. We, uh, we arrived there in 2015. Um, the course had fallen uh, into bankruptcy. Uh, the bank uh, took it back over and, and engaged our services. And five years later, um, we are uh, generating, uh, you know, a positive operating income of uh, approximately three hundred thousand dollars. And uh, so there was just a number of things that had to happen in order to be able to achieve that. And we had to rebuild the brand. Um, the, uh, the the golf courses or the golf course had fallen into disrepair, and and so people aren't going to want to go back there unless they know the experience is going to be improved upon. And we were able to do that. And even in a challenging location such as uh, what we have here at the city of Brandon. Uh, you know, you're a little bit off the beaten path, so we need to give people a reason 
to drive the extra 10 or 15 minutes to get here. And we were able to, uh, to achieve that at, at Kings Deer in, in Monument, Colorado. About the same time we started uh, at the city of Sioux Falls, we, we uh, were engaged uh, through a similar process by the city of Council Bluffs. They had about a quarter of a million dollar uh, deficit at, at Dodge Riverside Golf Course, a wonderful golf course um, with terrific uh, facilities there. And, uh, and we were able to achieve the uh, objective in, in 2020 where um, we pretty much, uh, pretty much eliminated that, uh, that annual uh, funding deficit. And they had a uh, significant number of uh, deferred capital needs as well. Um, so, you know, just really proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish. And as I stand before you here today, that's what drives us. That's what drives our team in Lincoln is to be able to lean on those experiences and, and uh, share those with, uh, with other municipalities and, and golf course owners like you. Okay, as we wind down here, um, when other golf courses have left, have they left on good, on bad terms? We have been, we, what have been other specific reasons for uh, any contracts to end prematurely? First and foremost, um, one of our five company values is to do the right thing. At every turn, we are going to do the right thing on behalf of our client and, and on behalf of our our team of people. Um, we are, I think, our next job will be uh, job number 113. Hopefully that'll be the city of Brandon. But I can say uh, without exception that we've been able to achieve um, that across the board, that we have left every property that we're not at today better than when we found it. I can say that with 100% confidence that if we are not working at a facility today, um, it was better than when we left it. So some of the reasons that, that uh, people don't leave is um, they, sell the, they sold, sold the course, um, contract ran its course and we achieved their objectives. And uh, um, you know, sometimes we, we enter engagements with, uh, with the end in mind that we want to get them to a certain point and then turn the, turn the operation over to, to them to, to self-perform. Um, but having said that, we don't want to be somewhere where we're not uh, where we're not delivering and not performing on behalf of the client either. So um, it's a it's a mutual um, understanding that um, it has to be a win-win situation. Now we have to have a, a proper amount of time to implement our philosophies and systems and pro protocols and procedures. Um, so we ask for you know for a minimum engagement in order to do that. And then at that point, if it's not working out, then then we uh, shake hands and, and uh, the property will be better than, than uh, when we found it. Who owns the software and customer data at the end of the contract? Very simply uh, stated, um, you do. We, uh, as far as proprietary information, we would probably, we would wanna make sure we leave with our employee handbook, with our policies and procedures manual. We will eliminate access to our company intranet that, that houses a lot of our best practices, but uh, otherwise, you know, uh, everything that, uh, that we um, hopefully uh, worked with Andrew and Kelly on to, to improve is, uh, is uh, you know, your, uh, your asset from there. Um, just wanted to, as Scott kind of spoke to this earlier, um, this is just a, uh, a National Golf Foundation um, map of where uh, rounds were up 2% two, uh, 2 or higher. And like he said, it, it happened across the country with the exception of a few, with few exceptions. And, and those were likely uh, stay at home type orders. But I draw your attention to the bottom right hand corner where North Dakota and South Dakota were, uh, were up 22.5% over prior year. I would just hesitate to, um, to point out that I, I, I hope that doesn't give you a false sense of security. We're going to try whatever we can to, to retain as much of that business as we can. Um, but, you know, I just hate for you to, uh, to think that that's going to be the, uh, the rule going forward more than the exception. Um, and then, so just in conclusion, um, why, why landscapes? First and foremost, culture. It's in our logo. It's at the core of everything we do. We want to make sure that we're creating a positive environment for our people to excel in. And we want to make sure that we have 
a open and uh, transparent relationship with, uh, with you and the city as well. There is a changing dynamic of golf. Um, as competitive as the industry is today, as much as technology is playing a, a factor in, in successful operations, really no longer can, does the, and Pete Davison with the National Golf Foundation published this quote that no longer is the general manager or, or director of golf adequately equipped to meet all the needs of the, of the operation today. And we happen to have that expertise under our roof that we, that we uh, work with our, with our teams on the ground. Challenge the status quo. Like I said in that previous slide, um, you really shouldn't expect different results if you continue to do the same thing. Um, we, you know, you're going to have our key thought leaders, the, myself, the two gentlemen behind me, and the people in the picture that I showed earlier <laughs> engaged in, in helping to achieve the objectives for the city of Brandon. So um, finally, our mission. We have a passion for golf, for creating market-leading operations, and for developing the best leaders in the golf business. That's what, that's what we want to do with the gentlemen sitting behind me, with Kelly and Andrew. We want to make them the best in, the, in their best leaders that they can be in the business to achieve a market-leading operation that you're, that you're proud of. And our vision is to be the most trusted and influential company in the industry. And I think if you give us an opportunity, we'll be able to demonstrate that to you. And uh, we, we'd love to have the opportunity to work with you. And uh, finished a little bit ahead of time and, and certainly entertain any additional questions you might have. Questions individual council would have? Uh, we have about eight minutes here, so let's hop to it. If you have some questions, get them out now. <laughs> um, in your 227,000 projection in five years, was that like kind of tailored to Brandon's numbers or was that more of a typical what you have seen type of projection? And if it's tailored to Brandon, where do we fall within what you've seen at other courses? Excellent question. Um, so we took your, your financial results, we put them into our model, and we applied statistics that, we're, that we have experience in achieving at other like facilities. And that's how we got there. Okay. <clears throat> that's the only way we knew how to do it. We 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 took your uh, you know your you have um, uh, four year averages. We had your we had your 2020 budget, uh, and uh, and we we took that and we we manip we put that into our model and we applied you know statistics that we have experience in achieving and. We believe we can achieve that. That's like what I spoke to at uh, at the city of Sioux Falls, um, Kings Deer, Dodge Riverside, etc. Way I understood the proposal, we'd come to some prearranged agreement of what uh, our goal is. Anything above the goal, we'd have a set percentage go to Landscapes Unlimited and a set percentage go to the city. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay, and that has not been determined. Has not been determined. And. We, we certainly recognize that the city has deferred obligations that, that need to be met. So we just want to have the opportunity, we want to be incentivized and have the opportunity to share in the upside. Right. Uh, let me assure you, Tom, we have way more obligations than your company could ever, ever, <laughs> ever create in profits. Uh, well, we want to make sure that the golf course is, is, uh, is not part of, your, part of your challenge. I understand. Um, but if I understand this correctly, so it would be like every year you would, I mean, you sit down with us, I mean, obviously initially, but then every year you come back and we tell you kind of what we're looking for, or what we want, like, right, like a, a plan we come up with Absolutely. every year. Okay. I know time's getting really shorter. Are you gentlemen sticking around for the discussion in the meeting? We certainly can. Okay. I guess I would appreciate that because when we finally discuss it, there's probably going to be more questions. It's one of the first agenda items in new business. I'd like to get those out now. I don't want to turn this into a debate during the board meeting. Let's get them out now if we can. This is what we're here for at 5 o'clock to get these questions out. So if you have more questions, Council, please address them now. <laughs> so.
So the management fee is uh, the 84000 a year. Uh, and walk me through the basics of the, of the financial um, uh, financial setup, let's just say. We pay you the 84000 you're paying all salaries, and where, where do you draw the line on, it's kind of a two-fold question, where do you draw the line on capital improvements and uh, maintenance? I think there's a fine line there probably. And, um, and then where, where do you see that percentage of profits going to you over and above the O&M? Yeah, good question, Mr. Parliament. Um, I, I would just like to make a clarifying statement that this is not any type of lease. We are, we are uh, an agent on behalf of the city uh, um, receiving uh, monies into your account and managing those, those uh, receipts on your behalf. So it, it's a fixed management fee, Mr. Parliament. You're investing in a team of people to make sure that your golf course can be operating at maximum efficiency. Um, it's so all the money is coming into your bank account, which you own, which we which we have access to, and um, and we are making disbursements out of that account um, on your behalf. And so, um, if there's capital equipment that needs to be procured, we are going to make a recommendation to you or uh, Mr. Reed or, or whoever our liaison would be um, as to what needs to be acquired. We would. Uh, present financing opportunities or you know however you want to pay for it we're going to bring that before before you for for approval okay um, switching gears a little bit um, you would, uh, and I know this was a point of contention with the, the prior uh, managers uh, in Sioux Falls that when when the decision was made to, to go with landscapes there was a lot of discussion about who owned all the assets. And you're, you're, I'm sure you're well aware of. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so I appreciate you said, you said that the uh, only thing that is proprietary would be, you know, your handbooks and things like that. Um, and you know that we own all the equipment now, so mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a no-brainer, obviously. But the, uh, like, uh, all the emails that are collected and all the other data from from uh, golfers, per se, uh, it's all marketing yours. materials as well. I think it's key. It's all Those yours. All are ours. It's all yours. Okay, it's good to know. Thank Just you. from an equipment standpoint, um, we are, like I said, going to be stewards of your equipment. We are going to provide financing alternatives. We're going to guide you in properly investing in that uh, asset. It's a you know it's a half a million dollar to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar asset that needs to be properly maintained and, and rolled out on a on a you know in a certain interval. Okay, last question for me. Barring weather, what would you what do you think will be the, the biggest challenge to grow the business? Sir? Biggest challenge to growing the business outside of weather? Um, really, just uh, a uh, you know, an open mind among your team, among the team that, that we have uh, to work with here. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. We have a full slate on our agenda tonight, so I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn this special meeting. Thank you for the opportunity. Motion a second to adjourn. All in for, uh, Christina, sorry. Hi, David. Hi, David. Motion carried. We're adjourned at uh, 5.59 p.m. Sure. Let's keep her going, though.